Let's throw out to Nick Wright, host of First Things First and the What's Right with Nick Wright podcast. What do you think of my rant, Nick Wright? Am I right? Tell me I'm right. Well, we are talking about pro golfers, right? Sure. Like, I'm not sure what the schedule is, but I don't think it's that taxing. I know a lot of people are like, hey, I want to retire. What are you going to do when you retire? I don't know, golf a oh, lot. Oh, come on, Nick. So I don't know. When we talk about the athletes, hold on, hold on. Wait, you asked me. When we talk about the athletes, who I'm like, oh, man, I worry about what the schedule is going to do for their body. Pro <laughs> golfers aren't near the top of the list of guys who I'm like, oh, I really, I don't know if they can handle it. I can I, I, I have a different take on the live tour in this regard. It's easy to throw money at people if you're not trying to be profitable. I don't know that the Live Golf Tour plans on making a profit any time in the next decade. So it's much like Uber when it first started. It's like, my God, Uber's going to put all the cabs out of business. And it's like, well, yeah, because they're operating at a massive loss. And so Live, it, they are playing by somewhat unfair rules in the, in, not unfair, but it's going to be, it would be hard for the PGA to compete with them financially because they seemingly do have a limitless supply of money. And I'm not sure if their number one goal is making a profit. I also, I'm not, I'm not going to act like I am in the, in the weeds on what professional golfers would like from the PGA tour, but I don't know. It doesn't seem like that taxing of a schedule. And I do agree with what Richard Jefferson said a few weeks ago about NBA guys, which is, Part of being a great professional athlete is, you know, exerting yourself and being able to overcome. So I'm a little old school on some of this. I And when I think about athletes who I feel badly for, <laughs> the golfers who are like, man, this schedule's hard for me. I I don't know. I don't feel that badly for them. I just think they want to take the money. Liv's offering them and more power to them. But I don't think it's because the PGA Tour is asking them, hey, and by the way, can you also make sure you're raking the trap for us on the weekends when you're not playing? Like, I don't think that's happening. <laughs> I think but you're going you know, to get a reaction from professional golfers on that one. <laughs> I don't think the guy who's kicking it around oh, and uh, oh. crushing hot dogs at the turn is uh, is at the same level as a professional golfer. But oh, we're gonna, I understand that, but we're going to act like these guys, the reason they're going to live is because no, no, I think it's, because it's of the money. going to be less strenuous on their body. No, it's the I, money. I think and it's, the rest is excuses. That's fine. I think it's because of the money. But I think when I look at situations like the PGA Tour, when I look at situations like what's happening with the NCAA and NIL, I see the same pattern with these massive institutions, which is, hey, give a little wiggle room. Stop being so rigid about everything. Have, a, have some communication with with your top talent, and maybe it won't become so explosive. Maybe you could convince them that it's really, really bad PR to go play for this live golf tournament because you've you've collaborated with them. You've made them feel like partners rather than employees when they're independent contractors. No, uh, your general overall thesis kind of uh, uh, as a general rule of life, I agree with you. Value your employees. Understand it is in most businesses the employees that make the company, not the other way around. I agree with all of that. When it comes to uh, the tiniest violin in the world because Patrick Reed's back hurts a little bit because he wants to play three rounds instead of four, that I'm not that concerned about. (laughs) All right, let's pivot to the NBA and we are in the the free agency window now and things are have sure. been pretty spicy. I have a lot of thoughts about what's happened with Kyrie and the Nets. I yeah. am I am not subscribing to the Nets being real contenders next year. They're running it back essentially with a so. less reliable third player than they had in James Harden, now in Ben Simmons who I don't even remember what he looks like when he plays basketball. And what's happened with Kyrie is is this never-ending story of everything is about Kyrie. So I don't really know what's changed. That said, I think this was the best-case scenario for the Nets, Kyrie, and KD. Well, I listen, they averted the nuclear winter of Kyrie leaving for nothing and then KD asking out yeah. and then being just totally objectively screwed. But I agree with you. I, listen, I think Vegas has their odds totally screwed up. And Vegas right now has them with better odds than Milwaukee, which is an outrage. Yeah. The, the Brooklyn Nets were 16 playoff wins away from a championship last year. <laughs> and next year, it's the exact same team plus Ben Simmons. Ben Simmons ain't worth no 16 playoff wins. I can tell you that much, no matter what version of Ben Simmons you're getting. 
And so I understand, yes, it is the best case scenario in that they didn't have to commit to Kyrie long term. But the other parts of this are ominous to me, Joy. The fact that Kyrie told Shams he was picking up his option before he told the Nets wouldn't make me feel overly confident. The fact that the Nets offered him a longer term extension and he didn't take it. Instead, he picked up the player option is ominous. I am, I'm not convinced, Joy, I don't know if you are, that Kyrie finishes the season with the Nets. I think that he is on his final strike with them. And because he picked up his option, he has no more leverage the rest of the year. They could trade him anywhere. And so I think they're going to try to see if it can work. But I also think one, you know, one paid time, an unpaid leave or paid leave, where it's sabbatical, whatever you want to call it, or I think that they will be shopping him if they need to. Yeah, I'm not convinced he's, he's with the Nets for the entire season. I'm just going off the information that we have right now, which is that he's going to be yep. with the Nets. Where do you stand on Kyrie right now? Kyrie doesn't outrage me. I, don't, I save my outrage for like real things, like you know losing rights over my body and stuff like that. Sure. I, I don't get outraged over what Kyrie does. But I also evaluate Kyrie based off of the information that I have. 11 seasons in the NBA, your reputation precedes you. He's not a reliable player. However great he is when he's on the court, if you have to say when he's a available after you say any player's name that takes you down a notch in your greatness i can't rely on you especially if you are Kyrie, who is the number two to kevin durant who is on any given night the best player in the world so i I can't build a championship team around someone who i don't know is ever going to be there no of course like listen i i think Kyrie is is one of the most talented players in his position ever i also think And this isn't me being a hater. This is me just objectively reading his basketball reference page. Kyrie Irving in his career has never received a single MVP vote. I'm not saying first place. I'm saying first, second, third, fourth, fifth. Damn, uh, Julius Randle and little Isaiah Thomas have gotten MVP votes in the last few years. Kyrie Irving never has. Kyrie Irving once in his career has been second-team All-NBA. He's never been first-team, and twice he's been third-team. So in his whole career, for a guy that people say is the most talented guy ever at his position, one year, at the end of the year, people were like, yeah, he was one of the 10 best players in the sport. Two years, he's been one of the 15 best, and every other year, not even there. So I, And that's because of availability. It's because that he has been a one-way player his whole career. And it's because, uh, except for when he's been alongside LeBron James, he's never contributed to winning. And so th- that's, that's a decade of a career that is just an objective telling of it. Now, there can be different reasons and rationales as to why it's gone happened that way, but that is how it happened. And the Boston Celtics made the conference finals without Kyrie Irving. They made the conference finals and then the NBA finals without Kyrie Irving. And the year he was there, they lost in round two and five. That is another objective telling of it. The Nets had a round two ceiling before Kyrie walked in the door. They've had a round two ceiling and this past year, round one ceiling with Kyrie Irving. That is an objective telling of it. It's one of the reasons why I think the Nets were okay with the idea that he might leave. And that, that, yeah, hey, go find a sign and trade. Like your, your talent is spectacular, but you're, if you are the least reliable great player in the league and you're not even one of the great, great players in the league, then it's, you start to undercut your own value. So there, there was a lot of conversation, and there still is, about him possibly going to Los Angeles. Now, I, I don't know. My brain doesn't work on how that fits or how they make that happen. They take a fifth mortgage out on the building. I don't know. I don't know why anyone wants Russell Westbrook. I don't know how any of that would happen. But uh, assuming that it doesn't happen, because it would be very difficult, what does this Lakers team look like with Russ on it next year? Oh, they're screwed. They're screwed. And it's so frustrating because... The Lakers, Jovan Buha, the athletic, r- reported they are shopping Russ, but they won't include one of those future picks. And to which I would say, why are the Lakers operating as if they expect to be terrible in four years? Oh, well, Nick, LeBron will be gone. But then, you, then you'll have a max salary spot available, and you're the Lakers. And Anthony Davis is under contract and in his prime, theoretically. The Lakers operating like, 
they must hold on to the 2027 or 2029 first round pick because that's going to be some franchise changer. It shouldn't be. You shouldn't need a franchise changer. You're the Lakers. And either LeBron is going to continue to be ageless and continue to be excellent, or he's going to be out of the league or on a different team the years leading into those picks. Either way, you should be fine. Because if he's out of the league or on another team, you have $45 million of cap space, Mm -hmm. and you're the most attractive free agent destination historically in NBA history, and you have prime Anthony Davis. So I don't understand how, why they're operating the way they are. I do not think that Russell Westbrook is going to become some totally different player. And hey, listen, I obviously root for the Lakers because LeBron's there. I, the only thing I'm looking forward to this Lakers season is LeBron passing Kareem. I don't, I, there's not going to be anything exciting coming out of that team as long as it's the same roster they had last year with minor tweaks and that roster was irrevocably broken. So I am drinking Clippers Kool-Aid over here on the West Coast because of uh, the John Wall move. Not because I think that he makes them that much better, but I, he's not somebody I have to rely on. He's, he's just a bonus added, essentially free bonus piece. And when he does play, he That's is right. a big contributor, at least offensively. And I, I like that. I also love Kawhi Leonard and Ty Lu. I think their owners, you know, enthusiastic but not overly involved so i'm i'm drinking the clippers kool-aid how am i crazy am i losing my mind no you're not listen i have been uh clippers pessimist i i've been short selling the clippers last few years and i've made massive profits doing that (laughs) literally and figuratively the gambling is legal so now we can tell you we make those profits in real life as well this year though i believe in them I think a year off for Kawhi rehabbing, I would expect him to play the most games he's played in quite some time and to be awesome. Paul George, we know exactly who he is. He's like the 14th best player in the sport. He's never going to be top eight. He's never going to be outside of the top 18. He's right there. And I agree with you entirely. You're not banking on John Wall, but he is a nice, low-risk, medium-sized reward potential player. And Ty Lue's one of the three best coaches in the sport. So I really like the Clippers going into this year, more than I've liked them any year in the past. And I think if John Wall has anything left, and keep in mind, John Wall didn't play last year, not because he was injured, but because the Rockets didn't want to play him. A similar thing happened with Al Horford. Al Horford got put on ice by Oklahoma City, and that actually helped him a ton. He had more in the tank this year for Boston because of it. I think a best-case scenario for the Clippers is Wall does have a decent amount left, and then you can move Reggie Jackson at, to what he should be, which is your point guard off the bench, not your starting point guard. Uh, yeah, I like the Clippers a lot this year. I, you know, I know that'll surprise people because I've always been a Clippers pessimist. But right now, I think they are poised to be with Dallas losing Jalen Brunson potentially. I don't think Golden State's going to be a juggernaut. The Clippers right now look like they should be at least co-favorites in the West. You don't think Golden State's going to be a juggernaut? No. Come on, Nick. No, no, no. Come on. I mean, listen, They're the they, dynasty. They, what do you mean? What? Draymond's saying three of the next four. No, they no, definitely no, no. win another championship. Oh, I don't. I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't agree with that. I mean, they it, listen. They won the title, and I give them massive credit for winning the title. They also are going to have some tough decisions to make this offseason. Draymond's also at this point a far more relevant podcaster than basketball oh, player. Oh man! And at the. Well, no, it's just we watch the games. Draymond says analyze the games. We can analyze the games. Listen, Mr. Triple Single is a dynamic media presence and at times a replacement level player. He has his moments. But no, the, 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 and, and by the way, the Warriors era has been dynastic, but they also are a team that prior to winning this championship missed the playoffs two consecutive seasons. So do I think the Warriors are the favorites? No, I don't. I don't think the Warriors are the favorites. And by the way, for all the all the chirping from Draymond, it, it, nobody would have thought they were the favorites if they didn't just win the title. And what flipped the series was the fourth quarter of game four when they were down 2-1 and they had the big comeback. And it should be noted that all happened with Draymond on the bench. When Steve Kerr said, oh boy, when Steve Kerr and Draymond's own mother were like, what is happening to my son and my player? And they sat him down. So, I mean, that all happened. 
You can say, Nick, that's old media. I don't know what it is. I think it's just an accurate telling of the truth. I think the Warriors will be good. I don't think they're the favorites. Milwaukee is far and away the favorites, for the record. Milwaukee would have crushed the world if Middleton didn't get hurt. They are the far and away overwhelming favorites. And then we're going to argue about who's the second best teams and third best teams. But I think the Clippers going into the year are better than Golden State. And I want to see what Dallas does. Ah. Okay. Well, I'm old media, too. Uh, I disagree with you that, that the Clippers should be favored over the Warriors. That is completely dependent on health, which is not the conversation with the Warriors. I have the Clippers favored. I do think Milwaukee should be favored to come out of the East, and then we can discuss everybody else. Uh, that was Nick Wright, Draymond, not Joy Taylor. Nick Wright <laughs> goes oh, don't the first things fr- first. I'm not taking the, oh, I'm not taking the heat for that. Bark, no bite. I am not taking the heat for that. Don't I also be disagree. Don't be afraid of Draymond. I'm not afraid of Draymond. I agree with Draymond. Okay, I think you're the top fine. dog. You get, you get to do all the bark, and that's how it goes. If you, if you win, then you get to stand at the top of the mountain and uh, point down in, at all everyone else. At you all just, the, at you're all the, the favorites every year if you're the defending champ. I think if you're That's a dynasty, I think if you're a dynasty, year. which they are, you deserve that respect. They are a dynasty. I, they've won four of the last eight. They are a dynasty. They could very well win another one. And I think they deserve that respect. Nick Wright, co the First Things First. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much See for you. coming on, Bye. Nick. Check out First Things First weekdays, 730 Eastern on FS1. And What's Right with Nick Wright. Great podcast. Uh, thank you to Nick for joining us. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.